I'd like to welcome everybody to our first uh, CBB, the Center for Bioengineering and Biotechnology's first How to Spin Off a Company, uh, and some key steps and who can help. And so we've brought together a number of experts, hopefully that will give you that expertise. And in the last part of, of this session today, we'll actually have some people that will be giving their pitch uh, to uh, test it out and get some advice on, on how to do that part as well. So I'm really excited about this whole, whole event. And I have to admit that this would not have happened without James Bond. <laughs> it happened that uh, my husband and I went to the symphony. We hadn't been to the symphony for some time, but they were having uh, uh, an event where they were going to play all of the James Bond theme songs, and that just sounded like a great thing to go and hear. And who was sitting in front of me but Benton Leong? And I've known Benton for some time, going back to some early years, back to the beginning of Maple. And uh, Maple, uh, then Benton really took M Maple to the heights, uh, spun that off into a company, so he's had a lot of experience. And from that uh, serendipitous uh, uh, meeting, we now have this event. So sometimes it just pays to be lucky. And that goes whether you're playing tennis or whether you're starting a company. You pursue every single angle that might help you get to where you want to go. So Benton, uh, then uh, we planned this event and it's with my great pleasure to introduce to you Benton Leong. He is now an angel investor. Uh, he's uh, one of the key organizers for GTAN. And I think without any further to do, please welcome Benton Leong. Okay. Thank, thank you, Shirley. Uh, so Shirley mentioned luck. And I, I must have had a large quantity of luck uh, over the past few years, over the past few decades, because when I think about one of the companies that I helped to found, you know, back in the 80s from research that was done on this campus, I'm still somewhat surprised that it's still here. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that it's still here. Uh, it's MapleSoft and it employs about 130 to 140, uh, 130 to 140 people. But uh, the, the fact that it's still here and has survived its beginning period is a little bit amazing to me because uh, I'll tell you that we came this close to actually killing the company any number of times. We made near fatal mistakes because we didn't know what we were doing. The company was started in 1986 based upon research that was done here on this campus in the computer science department. And it was uh, formed by a number of professors, uh, graduate students, and researchers based upon our work on symbolic math algorithms. And there was a demand for this uh, throughout the world. Our colleagues wanted to use this. And so we started charging our colleagues throughout the world a small fee for, at that time, it was a, 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 a eight track tape that we would send them and postage and handling. All of a sudden, we, we found that they regarded themselves as our customers. And they were calling into the lab upstairs for support. Right? So we were accidental entrepreneurs. We didn't start off trying to start a business, but we found ourselves being in a business. And of course, the proper thing to do is not to run a business from, from Canvas, but to spin it off into a proper company, which is what we, we did. So we did that. I think that we had the right intention. We didn't have the right skill sets. We were all academics, researchers. We didn't know what we didn't know. And that was what almost killed us. Uh, uh, we argued amongst ourselves. We didn't know how to run a company. Uh, so, so I'm going to give you some, some very practical advice, advice that may not be all that apparent to you now as you're thinking about starting a company or thinking about taking the results of, of the research that's done on this campus and sort of uh, creating, creating a, a commercial company with it. So what are the fatal mistakes that, that, that near fatal mistakes that we made that I would advise you not to do. One is that it's very easy with a group of founders to shake hands and decide on the di distribution of both responsibilities and ownership of the company when there's no money on the table, right? 
we're dividing a zero dollar pot. Oh, you take 20, I'll take 50, I'll take 10, right? Get it in writing. Make sure that everybody agrees to the divi division of both responsibility, authority, and equity in the company. Have that reviewed by a lawyer. Another mistake that we made is that one of our colleagues said, oh, I've got a lawyer that we can use. He's relatively inexpensive. He does work for me. So we'll be able to get a good rate for him, right? Never, 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 never I never thought that, oh my God, there's like conflict of interest. Red flags should be going off. So, so off we went to this real estate, no, family law lawyer, and, uh, and, and he papered a deal that in fact wasn't equitable. It led to lawsuits later on. So make sure that you have a firm understanding of the assignment of your IP rights to the company. Make sure that everybody does it on the same terms or on, on terms that you can all agree to and do it at the same time. We had eight founders of the company. We were somewhat lax a days ago about assigning our rights to the company. Guess what? The last person to sign all of a sudden wanted to change the terms and he was able to hold the company hostage. We had to get his signature and, 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 and he wanted to improve the, 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 the terms to favor him. So do it at the same time. Go to a lawyer that has expertise with startup companies. Back in the 80s, they were very few and far between. These days, there's a small handful of, of, of lawyers in town that have a lot of experience working with startups, technology startups, uh, and, and, and they'll be able to help you. Some of the companies that I do help or advise, they've started off with a lawyer very similar to the one that we had back in the 80s. It would be a real estate lawyer who really has very little inkling of the challenges that a technology startup face. So for example, one of the lawyers that, that I did meet with created out of uh, a, a team of nine founders, nine classes of shares, which basically leads to veto power by any one of the founders. The founders themselves created a board, uh, a board of directors of all nine of them, not realizing what they were getting into as far as their fiduciary responsibilities uh, uh, and, and, uh, and responsibility. So uh, that was a non-starter. Uh, not only that, but two of them were students from offshore. So automatically, the, uh, the foreign ownership of, of the company starts to become an issue. Uh, and, and, and so they did, they did quite a few things that I wouldn't recommend. Their lawyer was not able to advise them that this is basically the wrong corporate structure for this startup. So my key advice is go see someone who has profes a professional background in this area and seek professional advice. Uh, so something that we did do well, which served us well for, for the next, next few years, is that we actually did finally turn to somebody from outside of the company to, to, to be our CEO. Uh, we hired a, a person by the name of Ron Newman, who is a very well respected uh, uh, entrepreneur in this area. Uh, as well as MapleSoft, he became the CEO of Slipstream, and uh, Digero Labs, and a few other companies. But we had a debate about whether or not our small company could afford to hire, a, at that time, a 100K or so CEO. The real question was, how could we afford not to, right? And left to our group of eight academics, we would have surely driven that company into the ground. So my advice for technology startups, especially formed by engineers and scientists, is reach outside of the circle of friends and colleagues that you're intimate with and, and look for someone with a business background to help you. Because you've got many challenges uh, ahead of yourself. And it's, it's, it's better if someone with knowledge, someone who's been there, done that, helps you with that path. Don't, don't try to do it yourself. But the, the world is very different between the situation that we faced in the 80s and what you have available today. And in fact, I can think of no better place in the world 
to start a technology company than right here in town. There is better government support. There's things like the, 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 the uh, shred tax program. There are uh, a number of incubators, not only here on campus, but also off campus, where you've got experienced mentors, people who have been CEOs, willing to lend their expertise and their time to help you, often at no cost, depending on the program that you're in. You know, right here on campus, you've got the, the Velocity program. Uh, there is also the Accelerator Center uh, and, uh, and, and all sorts of resources. Th these were not available to us back, back in the 80s. And there is funding that are available, not only from government programs, uh, but, but also from investors now. So Waterloo has evolved over the past few decades so that there have been some, some, some fairly well-known successes. The people who benefited from those successes are in a position where often, very often, they'll, they'll come back and give back to the community in terms of both their advice and their capital. So I, I, I was fortunate enough to, to have an exit uh, uh, with MapleSoft in 2009, our Japanese distributor, CyberNet, purchased the company, and it was a chance for all the founders to, to cash out. So, you know, having been lucky enough to experience that, what I'm doing is taking some of that capital and helping the next generation of entrepreneurs. But, but it's, it's really more the mistakes that I've made that I think that are valuable, not so much the, the capital. So, so anyway, we've got, we've got a, a pretty full program for you folks today. And uh, I've invited a, a, a number of people who've uh, been there, done that, and, and, and also some of the government funders who are here to help support your fledgling, uh, fledgling uh, initiatives or ventures. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to uh, Tim Lashak. Tim is one of the founders of a brand new company that just got started this year based upon research that's done at the Center for Nanotechnology, uh, and uh, I'll turn it over to Tim. Yeah, thank you, Vanda. <clears throat> All right, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, I guess I will preface this by saying um, I definitely don't consider myself an expert in entrepreneurship yet, um, so please take anything I say to you with uh, a grain or two of salt. Um, I, uh, HG Now is a relatively young startup, and uh, I'm definitely still a student of business, but I'm eager to learn. Um, I do have a lot of experience with research, though. Um, I am a graduate of the Nanotechnology Engineering Program here at Waterloo, class of uh, 2013. Um, and during that time, I spent all my co-op work terms uh, under the supervision of uh, Professor Frank Gu, um, and I'm currently doing my a PhD over in the uh, Mike and Ophelia Lazaridis Quantum Nano Center on the uh, ideas that eventually became H2 Nano. Um, so uh, what, what I want to speak to you about today is uh, what I see as kind of the intersection of uh, academic experience and, uh, and what it's like to actually form a startup from my perspective um, and what I see as one of the the key issues in doing so. So firstly, I guess a bit of background on uh, H2Nano, on our company. Um, the problem we are trying to address is complex industrial waste streams, uh, specifically looking at oil and gas industry, uh, mining, pharmaceuticals, uh, basically complex, uh, very persistent pollutants in water that don't have a currently practical or economical means of treatment. Um, so what we aim to do with this new company is uh, develop uh, innovative solutions, practical solutions, uh, to meet these unmet needs. Um, one of the key ideas, this is the one that uh, kind of shepherded from my undergrad experience and one of the core ideas of our uh, startup is we have this nanotechnology system. It's solar activated. So it harvests sunlight and uses that solar energy uh, to degrade uh, these very persistent pollutants. And so you can take clean water, or sorry, dirty water, 
and, uh, and make it clean again. Um, so this is one of, one of the key ideas, and we had this working um, at the lab scale, at the bench scale. Um, and it was just back in May that uh, uh, we had some angel investors of which uh, Benton and uh, Mr. Murray Gamble, I can uh, proudly say, are our supporters. Um, they proposed to us the idea that a startup company um, could be a vehicle or an avenue to take ideas, uh, what they saw as a good idea, out of the, li out of the laboratory um, and transform it into a product that would fit with the industry. So kind of that intermediate step. Um, and uh, that is basically what we're doing with the company now. What we've been doing for the last few months is uh, trying to take this lab prototype and scale it up into something that is practical for real life. Uh, so I have a few thoughts I want to uh, pass along on my uh, experience so far. Uh, they are all cliches, so I do apologize for that, but I will try and flesh them out. Um, so one thing uh, I can speak to about academic research, at least, um, I've published a number of papers, a uh, number of patents along the way, um, but especially in my PhD work, you're expected to focus on a very narrow, very specific problem. Um, extremely narrow focus, uh, which is not necessarily representative of real life. Um, often in academic research, uh, practical application is a bonus. What, what really matters is that your idea is new. Who cares if it ever has uh, any benefit to society or real life? Um, so I think one aspect is uh, trying to break that mentality, at least if you are within the academic institution, um, and trying to reorient to see the problems as the industry sees it, to try and understand a client perspective. And I'm saying this is important if your intention is to uh, make a benefit to society and actually take your ideas and commercialize them, which I assume everyone in the audience has some interest in. Um, second thought is uh, leaving the comfort zone. Uh, so as I mentioned, all my co-op work terms are spent in the lab. I'm a bit of a lab rat. Um, so this whole commercialization uh, experience is completely new to me. It is definitely outside my comfort zone. Um, so one of the uh, industries uh, we are looking to address initially with our startup is the Alberta oil sands. Uh, they have about a billion tons, that's not an exaggeration, um, of industrial process water being stored in these massive tailings ponds. You can see that as an upgrading facility with all those smokestacks in the back. And this grayish lagoon in front is one of many tailings ponds that are out in Alberta. They have a massive, massive need um, for new technologies to address this uh, critical issue. This is my comfort zone. Um, that is uh, about a beaker, about EA high. Um, and uh, this is what I'm good at. You can ask me to design uh, nanoparticles. I'll do it all day. Um, but actually translating this into something that is actually meaningful to these executives at these massive oil companies um, and trying to get, get their interest um, has been a learning process. Um, so. Comfort zone is, uh, it's also from the academic perspective, it's not really sexy. You can't publish a high impact paper usually um, on just scale up of a process. It's always uh, some new discovery, some new scientific advance. Um, and uh, the, the resources are not necessarily there for that either in terms of pure research funding. Um, however, I think step three is the the critical piece, at least from my perspective, from what I've learned so far, um, is being able to make that connection, being able to understand a problem, a technology, your technology, at a very fundamental level, to understand every aspect of it from the ground up, um, but also the client perspective, the industry need, what factors are or are not important uh, for your idea to actually make a difference and be adopted and to, to gain those customers. Um, and I think that is probably the critical skill set. Uh, you, you can have great scientists, you can have great businessmen, 
um, I think there's a need uh, for, for people in the entrepreneurial role to bridge that gap and connect those dots. And that is, that is where we're at now. So you can see our beaker is uh, about a thousand times larger than we started out. Um, and we definitely have a long way to go. Um, but we're getting there one, one step at a time. Uh, just want to finish up by touching on some, some resources that we have found extremely helpful in our journey so far um, to, uh, in, in founding this company. So the, the critical one, which uh, Benton already spoke about uh, from my perspective, is advice and mentorship. Uh, I was just uh, telling Benton before this talk that I feel like I'm doing two PhDs at the moment. One is in the lab on my engineering research. The other is... Uh, trial by fire in uh, this business world that is equally a learning process for me. Um, however, there's outstanding resources out there, uh, especially here at the University of Waterloo. Um, so our, our angel investment team has been a great resource. Um, our company is currently based uh, out of the Accelerator Center Incubator, which is just north uh, here in the research park. Um, they have some outstanding mentorship on every aspect of business from human resources to product, um, which we found very helpful. Um, another key factor is angel investment. So um, uh, these investors could have taken their, their hard-earned money um, and gone on a cruise, but uh, they didn't. Uh, and it, I think it takes a certain vision um, to be able to provide that seed funding to actually do this research that isn't strictly academic but is vitally important to actually uh, make anything happen in real life. Uh, another uh, critical resource is uh, directly talking to industry. Um, so we are in the process of uh, speaking directly with these companies to try and set up uh, R&D uh, contracts where they can fund uh, paid alpha tests or pay, paid pilot tests. Um, and there are, of course, a, a variety of government uh, grants as well from NSERC. OC and others, um, and a lot of those operate on a one-to-one -one matching program with uh, certain industries. So if you can get a potential client interested, uh, that initial money they're willing to give you can be leveraged uh, and used to raise a lot more uh, resources to work with. Uh, so I want to conclude by saying um, the reason I came here to Waterloo was I am passionate about uh, seeing technology make a difference in the real world. I think it is a shame when uh, graduate student research, years of hard work, uh, basically just ends up as a dusty dissertation on some professor's shelf. Um, so I think if you are uh, in the position I found myself in, uh, with an idea you really believe in, um, and want to make a difference and make uh, a benefit to, to society, uh, I encourage everyone uh, in this room to consider the entrepreneurial path, uh, I do think, is one of the, the critical ways uh, that you can actually translate an idea out of the lab. So thank you very much. So, so not only professors and graduate students who are creating companies, but the, the entrepreneurial spirit, in fact, pervades this entire campus. And something that I find almost unique about Waterloo, amongst other institution, educational institutions uh, throughout Canada, maybe even throughout North America, is that we have uh, so many of our bright students who start companies even while they're uh, finishing their undergraduate degree. So Alexa Roper is uh, one of those, and she's supported by the Velocity program. So I'll, I'll let uh, Alexa explain about Pentamedical. When I came, first came to UW, I was totally lost. I knew that I was passionate about science, and I knew that's what I wanted to do with myself. Um, but I got lost in my own biology buildings. I was even confused about which courses I was taking. And I was totally overwhelmed by a stack of textbooks that weighed almost as much as I did, or at least I thought they did. <laughs> it kind of felt like it. The reality is that everyone in this room has been at some point like this at some point in their lives. No one just automatically goes somewhere and knows exactly what they're supposed to be doing there all the time. Um, but what's important is working your way through this. And this is why a lot of people will see an undergraduate student starting a company and say, wow, how can they do that? They're not that experienced. They don't have that much wisdom or 
you know, they don't have the same knowledge base as a grad student or a PhD student might have. How is it possible that they're doing this? The reality is, if you have good mentors, which we have in the Waterloo ecosystem, it's not about knowing everything. Because as soon as you have these good mentors on your board, you can get past that. And it's not about having an infinite knowledge base, because you can hire for that. And you can hire really, really talented people if they'll believe in your idea. So anyway, so I came here, and we started going on work terms. <laughs> and I was looking at what all my friends were looking into for jobs. I started working in a lab, and I was like, wow, this is really great because I love science, but I don't think that working at one of these machines is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I started looking at other places I could work. I started taking opportunities to work in like office spaces, so doing accounting and stuff like that. And I was like, wow, this is really great as well, and I can see how I have friends who want to work in this. But for me, it totally lost the passion of science and everything that I was originally so interested in. And the reality is now, which a lot of students here know, that just because you have a degree, it doesn't mean you're going to get a job. Degrees are not the be all and end all. You, just, you earn your jobs. So for me, I wanted to find something I was truly passionate about, but I still didn't know what that was. So towards the end of last year, I broke my foot, which to most people would just be a minor inconvenience. But for me, having just made it to Ontario Championships, being told I wasn't allowed to ride was extremely devastating. So this was what sparked my idea to work on accelerated healing. During this time, I was doing research into all kinds of accelerated healing because I was so super interested in it. After a while, I came up with my idea, and then I went to philosophy science, where I, oh, sorry. <laughs> then I went to philosophy science, where they helped me figure out my business plan and all this. There we go. So the difference was, I was still a science student, so I had to figure out a lot of the business stuff. And we've heard a lot of mentors talk about all the resources there are in the community, but what they haven't talked, spoken about is how do you get into those. What I found is it's not enough, it's not that it's not enough, but it's not the right thing to just show up and be like, hey, I'm here, please help me. You need to show everyone that you have a passion, a drive for what you're doing. And you need to show them that what you're doing is worth helping. So going, going to like events like this, or going to anything where you can talk to people about what you're doing and show them how excited it makes you, and how hard you're working on it, and why you're dedicating yourself to it. And that, yeah, I don't have the same experience as a PhD student, but that's okay, because I know how to find a team that can work with me to build what I want to build. Anyway, this was this past year when I was pitching, we won 15K as well as a five-day Google Design Sprint. Um, and I mean, if you look back at me from first year, you could have never thought, wow, that girl's going to get this far. But that's, I mean, that's re the reality of all of our paths, is that we just need to keep working at what we're doing and take advantage of everything we have in this community. Because if, as soon as you find something you're really passionate about, this Waterloo ecosystem will like push you through and be like, yeah, you can do this. You can work on it. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. As well as hearing from some of the people who recently founded companies, uh, I've also asked some of the people who are part of the support system to talk about their various programs. Uh, amongst the government funders who are active in the Waterloo area, there's the IF program, the OCE program, the IRAP program. And so let me just ask uh, Tomas and also Jesse to come up and, and uh, Keith give a brief introduction about how you support <coughs> fledgling uh, ventures. I can hear you. Yeah, great. So, um, thanks uh, for inviting me. Yeah. And I'm happy to uh, spend a few minutes explaining our app, and I'll, I'll be around if there are uh, questions. But I'd like to ask, how many people here have heard of IRAP? So uh, the reason I ask is that we are uh, notionally later on in the ecosystem. So as I'll explain, we, we fund um, and support and engage companies at a somewhat later stage of uh, development. So um, so what I'll do today is kind of give you a very brief overview, kind of highlights sort of how our model works, and hopefully you'll see yourself somewhere in the model, either because you're still kind of early stages for us, or, or maybe you see a path to uh, engage with us more, more actively. So, uh, so uh, in speaking generally, we're a federally funded R&D program. We um, target 
target companies with 500 or fewer employees, which is about 98% of all companies in Canada. Um, we're a field-delivered program, which means that most of our meetings take place in somebody's office, facility, plant, or um, a few times a year at their kitchen table. Okay. And uh, that field-based nature of our program is an important thing, so we, I'll come back to that a few times. Essentially, we offer financial support, non-refundable financial support, so it's the best kind of support, no equity, no loans, it's, it's cash to support activities. And um, we also have a menu of services that can apply to a broad range of, of companies. So. Um, so what do we focus on? Um, from this list, you'll, you'll hopefully get a sense that we are working with later stage companies. So essentially, um, a company that uh, has a, a notion of generating or producing some kind of value in their product or technology is great, but then we also look at the capacity to deliver that value and ultimately uh, capacity to, to capture that value in terms of uh, revenues and profit. So usually we're working with companies that have launched something or have gained a considerable amount of traction. Um, particularly when it comes to financial support, as I'll explain in a second. This is the financial side of our model. Uh, we can fund up to a million dollars to support a part of the labor portion of a project. So essentially, we're, we're in helping to employ Canadians to do R&D, which is a high value add sort of activity. So that's kind of the policy piece of it. Um, it's a shared risk model, which means that we're not supporting um, overheads, we're not supporting um, capital uh, materials. So uh, companies that become our clients typically have to have financial capacity to undertake the kind of work they're doing. Um, we support up to 80% of, of wages. Uh, we encourage and allow contractors, but we only support half of the cost of a contractor in the labor portion of a contractor. And one thing that we do quite frequently with earlier stage companies is support the hiring of a, of a new graduate. And that's a very good way of introducing a graduate into the workforce as well as providing a resource to an earlier stage company that might not be able to, in fact, um, engage in a larger project. So as far as advisory services, so we have a network of advisors. They're the field delivery thing, uh, piece of our model that I refer to. And they're typically working kind of really grassroots, uh, determining needs of companies and whether or not there is something that we have in our, our um, kit bag, so to speak, that might help in terms of uh, moving their, their, ma their uh, affairs and fortunes forward. So it could be from networking, advice, serendipitous sort of intervention to there are programs that we offer that are more specific where we can provide a service. And um, some of these require some explanation, but we can basically land an expert in, in somebody's um, facility to give them three or four or five days of, of work, which then hopefully will trigger some other activities that uh, provide benefit to the company. So um, I'll leave it at that. And uh, I'll be around for a bit, so if there are any other questions or, or comments, I think I got five minutes anyways, right? So, okay, thanks. Thank you. Please introduce uh, uh, Jesse Maggard from uh, OCE. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk about how OCE um, supports commercialization today. Okay. So I'll start with everybody wants to know about funding. So that's sort of how our programs are laid out, right? Um, our programs are there's a whole lot, lot of them are for collaborative research. So for companies to work with academic researchers and students to develop new technologies. Um, there's programs that are under commercialization, which is to be used in the first three years of a company being formed. And, it, and I will go into these programs a little bit more in detail. And then we have another whole large bucket of programs which are sort of theme-based calls that come and go and they sort of, you, you sort of have to stay in touch with us so that you know when they come up and when they're relevant to you. So the commercialization, that middle bucket, that's generally what the startups need to use. There's, um, it, it, it sort of follows into three categories, of uh, three, three phases of funding. It starts out with, you know, 30 to $60,000 
They do require a cash match, and um, basically it's hoping to use that funding to help you go from, uh, well, building up your minimum viable product, which I don't think anybody mentioned it yet, but sort of that scaled down, very basic functionality product that you can barely get somebody to pay for, all right, and some initial sales. And then it goes into, so you can apply for a little bit more money, up to 125,000, uh, still have to have some cash match, probably either from investment or maybe revenue. And now you're hoping to grow the sales, develop a sales model that really works. And then the last phase is company building, which is, uh, you know, again, more money, match with investment to really scale the business. Now you know how to sell, then let's get you a lot of people and make sure you can sell it repeatedly. So these programs, which work extremely well for software companies, um, sort of work for light electronics and stuff, for the kind of biomaterials, biotechnology that are in this room, I, I understand this is only going to fund a portion of your R&D and your commercialization uh, program, but it is there. And then, so my next slide will sort of talk a little bit about, you know, what you need before you try to access those programs, and also some of the other programs that can maybe uh, come in and solve some of that additional funding needs, okay? So obviously, you need to have some sort of a technology. Ideally, you would already have a prototype that's working. You have a pretty good understanding of its performance capabilities, so you can talk about it and what IP potential is. If you're in biotech, if you're in, you know, any kind of hardware, you should have IP in, your, in the back of your mind. Now, one of our funding programs called uh, Medical Science Proof of Principle can come into uh, use for you to get to your first prototype, get some data. Um, so, so if you're at that phase where you don't have a prototype yet, you, you should talk to us about that program. Um, you, whenever you are um, thinking about commercialization, you need to sort of have some idea of a commercialization plan. It doesn't have to be super detailed with all the I's dotted and T's crossed, but you have to have some idea who's going to use it, who might buy it, and maybe how much you can charge for it you know, who your competition is. This is background research that you should have done while you're just developing a prototype, right? So, and generally what we suggest is that you should have probably, if you're very technical, you should have some co-founders to round out your uh, so expertise. And that those people should have a business interest, commercialization inclination, right? Um, so if you're a professor, we generally say the best the best candidate is probably your one of your grad student that seem to like business, because these people have sort of your uh, the technical expertise to understand uh, what you're doing, but at the same time will spend the time to work on the, the technology. And if you've already supervised them, there's a trust that's been built up. That's a great way to form a team. Another alternative way to do that is using uh, WACO, like the Waterloo Technology Transfer Office. So there are tech transfer officers there that are you know, connected to industry, that have a lot of experience, and, and they can help you initially figure out a potential path of moving forward. And in the rare occasions, sometimes we say you can maybe seek out an embed team. These are teams of students that have probably some technology background and looking to uh, start up companies. And while they are helping you doing that background research in how to you know, form a commercialization plan, then hopefully in that process, you will build up some rapport with them and work with them in the long run as a co-founding team. So you, you wanna have that plan and you need market validation because all, almost all of our funding programs require, uh, I guess I forgot to mention that, all of our funding programs have some cash matching, and if it needs to come from industry, it's our best way to know that the technology, there's somebody interested in your technology, that there's companies interested in buying it or using it, right? So it's about um, using maybe your co-founding team to help you find a, an industry partner. And that could be a customer, like an end user, somebody that you'll eventually sell to, 
but uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be that. It could be a distributor, people that will, that knows the end customer really well and knows how to get it to them and, and, and so that you don't actually have to uh, deal with the end customer depending on the sector you're in. And the other thing that we sort of call, it's a commercialization agent. So it could be a company that would uh, step in and turn your product, uh, turn your technology from that prototype into a product. It could be an established company that you know is already in this sector and wants to build that technology and deploy it into your uh, potential customer base, or this is often the best vehicle for a startup. So we do sometimes see projects where you know you have an end customer that puts in the money, you have a, a startup that you guys are running, but there's also some research that's being done to, to, to get the product up to base. So market value, and, and we have some program like uh, the Explore program, which we run with um, the Quebec's uh, consortium of pharma companies. So if you're in biotech, you might be interested in that. Um, it, it helps you to part, um, if you get selected, you will be paired up with one of the large seven uh, pharmaceutical companies, and they will assign very senior level technical people to mentor you on how your technology potentially can be used uh, in their discovery and, and manufacturing processes. And VIP is sort of another program where if you do find that um, industry partner and you want to uh, really move that technology further along to meet their uh, needs, that, that's a program that you can use. And in the end of the day, like I said, all of our funding require matching, right? So, um, you know, it, it could be industry, which we talked about, but it could be uh, early stage angels. There are some very friendly angels that if you can convince them it's a good idea, um, they will put money in early enough that even when you're working on your prototype or, or validating your technology. And there are um, some sector-oriented uh, fund, investment uh, funds that are looking uh, for solutions into a certain sector, right? So there's one that I work with, uh, that I've worked with, that specifically looking for water-oriented technologies. So, so then they will again invest earlier because they see sort of the opportunity of the marketplace and they specialize. Um, and there are foreign investments now that are coming in, uh, often willing to take a risk earlier than some of the local investors are willing to do. And if you're in biotech, you should never discount foundations, uh, especially like the ones that raise money for um, rare diseases and stuff. So if you're developing something that's suited to a special disease or something, do look into these. They often have uh, investment or grants that you can go and get money. And, and with that funding, then you can apply for some of our grant funding to you know, double uh, your uh, to du double the money that you can use to develop your product and commercialization. So, knowing, given the time, just a couple of key takeaways. It's never too early to talk to us. We are very friendly. We try not to, uh, we, we try to be very constructive, you know, in our feedback. And ultimately, there, like I said, we have a lot of theme-based funding that comes and goes. So the sooner you tell us what you're working on, the sooner we will be able to let you know when a relevant funding program comes up. And often we let you know before the official announcements are made, which will give you that extra month or two to really pull together your industry partners or the matching funding. The other thing is, um, like I, I mentioned before, commercialization is, is very hard to do by yourself part-time. If you're a professor and you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna start a startup and you know, in my spare time, I'm gonna run this startup. Um, our track record have seen, shown that it's really hard to do that. You, you really need dedicated people and you need a, 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 a whole slew of expertise to make that team work. So it's a team exercise and that means you have to share the rewards. So you can't tell your PhD student, I'm giving you nothing and you're not gonna be paid for two years, but you're gonna commercialize my time. So, so you have to share, right? And you have to delegate. You, ha you, you, you have to be able to say, okay, trust these people to be able to make intelligent decisions and not have everything come back to you and make decisions 
um, be delayed that way, right? Um, and ultimately, um, in investment circles, they will tell you that good teams will attract funding, will attract investment. Even if your technology is not the best in the world, but with a good team, you'll make money off of it. Even if you have a great technology, but a, not work, a, a non-functional team, then people will not invest because they will, you, a good technology can still be screwed up along the way. So you, you, you really want to form a good team and make sure everybody's bought into it. All right, thank you very much for your time. And feel free to ask us questions.